Hello and welcome back to the Donahue Group. We're delighted that you could join us for another half hour of good conversation and uh, interesting ideas and maybe a little fun along the way. Uh, I, we have a special guest with us today, uh, Jay Heck from uh, Common Cause in Wisconsin. But before we introduce Jay, I want to go around and talk, introduce our other panel members. I know we're becoming beloved to all of you, but just in case you don't remember, <laughs> Ken Risto is the Director of Social Studies uh, for the Sheboygan Area School District. Tom Paneski is a professor of mathematics at uh, the University of Wisconsin uh, Sheboygan uh, campus. Cal Potter, former state senator, former employee with the Dep Department of Public Instruction. That always takes me a long time to say in, in any event. Um, I'm uh, Mary Lynn Donahue. I practice law here in Sheboygan. Cal, I would be delighted if you would introduce Jay. I, I know that, uh, that you're old friends. Okay. Uh, Jay Heck is with us. Jay is the Executive Director of Common Cause in Wisconsin, a 4,000 uh, member uh, public interest group, uh, also affiliated with Common Cause on a national level. And Jay will give us a little background on what his organization is and its history uh, after I get done with the uh, bio that I have. As uh, Mary Lynn has mentioned, I knew uh, Jay since his coming to Wisconsin and having worked uh, earlier with the state legislature. And so I could probably give you a bio, but it wouldn't be do justice to this young man's uh, background <laughs> and accomplishments. So I will take the, uh, the, the email bio that he sent to me and, and without the notes saying, get it right. <laughs> no. But Jay, Jay is uh, a person who has been with Common Cause for 10 years. He assumed the directorship, executive directorship in, in uh, 96, 1996, and he did before that, served for three years as government affairs uh, and uh, chief lobbyist, really, for the Wisconsin Association of Independent Colleges and uh, Universities. Uh, prior to coming to, uh, or he came to Wisconsin in 1988 to assume a, a, an assistant role to uh, then Senate Majority Leader Joe Stroll, uh, and then worked in our Senate Democratic Caucus particularly in the area of media, where I got to work with Joe on, on, on media presentations. And we won't talk about the quality <laughs> thereof, but we, he did a good job in trying to make the show and make uh, my presentations as, as good as possible. He worked in that capacity uh, until his uh, taking the job at the independent colleges and universities. He does bring uh, to his executive directorship also experience on a federal level. He worked for a congressman uh, from th uh, Pennsylvania in the 1980s. And so when he talks about uh, what's going on in, in Madison, what's going on in Washington, D.C., he really does bring a, a real world experience having worked in both arenas. And that, I think, is, has served him well in his uh, directorship. He also was active in the uh, John Anderson presidential campaign of uh, 1980. And so again, he brings uh, a myriad of, uh, of good experience. He's a native of Cleveland, Ohio a 1979 graduate with honors from Miami University. He's married, has two children, and resides in the fine city of Madison. And without further damaging his, uh, his, <laughs> his career and his accomplishments, I'll turn it over to Jay. <laughs> Uh, Jay, we're uh, delighted that you <laughs> that you can stand us, and uh, can stand uh, we uh, had a, a, a most interesting conversation in our last episode. Uh, these are sort of like the Star Trek episodes, you know, it's a star year 22.4, but uh, talking about really the extraordinary times in Wisconsin now. Uh, <clears throat> Governor Doyle is uh, up to his neck, I think, in hot water, we can all agree. Uh, the um, Scott Jensen coming up for trial. In, these are interesting times for Wisconsin politics, and we talked about some of the ethics, proposed ethics reforms. Um, I just wanted to focus a little bit more on your sense of just, I, I'm kind of a political junkie, um, and a just flat out supporter of Jim Doyle. I've always liked Jim Doyle. <clears throat> a little disturbed or a little discouraged about what's going on. Are these three uh, issues we have the, um, I call it travel gate after the uh, Clinton <laughs> debacle some years ago. Uh, the problem with the DOT fundraiser and um, the Kwani nuclear power plant. The, right, the, the, the right. power plant, the contributions uh, to, to the utilities while um, the, the PSC was considering their application. Um, how just how damaging are these in a really, I think what's, I think we can all agree is going to be an extremely hotly contested um, gubernatorial race. Does this sink him? Well, it uh, doesn't help, <laughs> as they say. Uh, 
<laughs> well, look, uh, first we'll, of all. We'll, we'll write that down. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not helpful. Uh, well, look, um, the governor is, I think, in some trouble. There's no question about it. Uh, and it's an election year. And obviously, there'll be partisans on the other side who'll seek to take political advantage of it. But you know, the question in each, in each instance, it's, you know, without going into great detail, I mean, the, the thread through all of it uh, is this sort of perceived need to raise a great deal of money to be elected governor of Wisconsin. And you know, if you look at the so-called tra travel gate, uh, what, it, what it involves basically is the awarding of a travel contract involving University of Wisconsin personnel. The idea was to award the contract to one agency to save the state money so that personnel at the UW were not making their own arrangements to travel all over wherever they have to go. Made sense. But the question, though, became why did the contract, why was it awarded to this one agency when on the first round of, of consideration, you know, another agency actually scored better in terms of lower cost. Uh, the contract was held open. Well, there was one individual who has been indicted now for two felonies who insisted that it be, it be held open. And the criminal uh, indictment says that it was, quote, unquote, for political considerations, including keeping her own job and also giving advantage to her supervisors. So, so the question on that really is what was the political consideration? Was it the fact that the travel agency owner contributed $7,000 or $10,000 to Governor Doyle's reelection campaign and somebody else on the board another 10,000 was that it it's not named in the indictment but the question is whether there was pressure brought to bear so again it's that it's the money it sort of was that the driving the driving problem there and we'll see i mean i'm the governor i'll take it take him in his word didn't know Georgia Thompson the person who was indicted probably didn't have any say whatsoever in the awarding of the contract but were there people who were political appointments of the governor who did? And so, you know, that's, as they said in the Watergate scandal, what did they know and when did they know it? That's, that's what we're going to have to find out. That's the there investigation. You and, you know, the same thing, the other thing, the number two person in the Department of Transportation was just cleared by the state ethics board of having acted improperly. But here's the problem. The number two person at DOT held a fundraiser for the governor for his reelection and invited contractors, engineering firms, that did business with the Department of Transportation and actually encouraged those folks to come to the fundraiser. And while it technically wasn't in violation of the law, the ethics board itself said it should be. It should be illegal, and obviously because of the conflict. Again, the overriding concern seemed to be this need to raise the money for the reelection. And then finally, the Kiwani nuclear power plant Two members of the Public Service Commission changed their vote on whether or not to sell the Kiwani nuclear power plant to a Virginia utility company. Was it because in the time between they changed their vote and they reconsidered, or they voted and they reconsidered, utility companies contributed some 30,000 or more to the governor's reelection campaign? That's under investigation. But again, it's this money or the perceived need to raise the money. So that's the governor's own particular problem. But certainly his Republican opponents have got problems, too. They sure do. I mean, you know, Congressman Green, over the years, accepted $30,000 from Tom DeLay, who has now stepped down as majority leader of the U.S. House of Representatives. That money appears to be tainted. Green says he's not going to spend it on his reelection. There's money from Jack Abramoff, which went exclusively to Republicans, and people are returning that money if they received it. And so, you know, there's, there's this whole now thing about we want to be clean, we want to be reformers, and everybody's scurrying for the political cover. And so, but it's going to be tough for the governor, there's no question about it. And one of the things that's disappointing to me, frankly, is, uh, and I'll make a confession, I voted for him too. And I voted for him because he, of all the candidates running both in the Democratic primary and in the general election in 2002, was the one who was most <clears throat> vehement about reform, the one who was most vehement about cleaning up Wisconsin politics. This is at the time of the Legislative Caucus scandal when Chuck Kuala and Scott Jensen had just been criminally charged. Doyle said one of his first acts as governor would be to clean up campaign finance and corruption in Madison. And then he becomes governor, and that became a secondary, even a tertiary consideration. We haven't heard anything about reform until recently. And so that's been terribly disappointing. Uh, so, you know, it's a problem. It's a bipartisan problem. Uh, and 
interestingly enough, corruption and politics and reform I think is going to be an issue uh, this year in a way that it, we haven't seen it as an issue probably any other year since maybe 1974. I think when Cal Potter was first elected to the legislature, that was considered the Watergate year, and a lot of folks were swept into office because of the scandal in Washington, which sort of reverberated around the country. Mm -hmm. I, we're not that far away from November elections, and I just am interested in all of your, your responses. Are there candidates, though, who are really coming up who are talking about these issues and, and, and really running on these issues? Um, I get, I get discouraged that the, the, the process itself is so daunting that you can't get into a race to even raise the issue uh, because you don't have enough money or enough backing. And I guess I'm pretty cynical about, we talked in the last show, only 6% of, of Wisconsin residents think legislators are working for them. The other 94% of us are we going to be able to, is there going to be a clean sweep? I, you know, I, I mean, do you sweep Doyle away? Do you get anything better with, with Green or with Walker? And Tom, I don't know what your thoughts well, are I mean, on that. I, but I mean, just following the Milwaukee County exec, I mean, he inherited a situation and he got a handle on it. So That's whether true. when he moves to, if he got elected to the governor, would he keep that same kind of philosophy or would, he, would it change? But he seemed like he got a handle on uh, what were some of the corruption that was going to be in the county government there. I, one of the disturbing things about the political scene today is not only the money, but there, are, uh, there has been a fragmentation of the electorate into special interests that oftentimes uh, not so much with money, but with the modern technology today can rattle the cage of a legislator uh, very quickly, um, whether it's the right to life people, the NRA people, um, when those issues come up, the emails come out, the uh, communications come out, and a lot of politicians today don't take on a lot of broad-based general issues like education or, or something like that, but they do talk about some of these one-issue uh, mm -hmm. things that where they know there's a constituency out there that electronically is tied to, to their membership and can get out votes, and they just say, well, not only do they count up the dollars, they say, well, if I add up all these groups and if I get 51% of the vote, uh, everybody else be damned. I don't have to follow what somebody else cares about health care or education or any sort of good public policy things. All I have to be right is on these special interests, these, these very monolithic groups that are out there and are very expressive on their issue. Yeah. See, on the national level, I don't see anybody, I mean, I, there's just a sense that everybody's corrupt and what difference does it make, you know, it's the old Who song, you know, here's the meet the new boss, same as the old boss. On a local level, or you know, when you talk about assembly races and perhaps Senate seats, it would just be intriguing to see if somebody would look into the camera and say, here's, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to limit my, camp, my campaign to X number of dollars. I'm only going to accept money from my district. I'm only going to accept more than you know, $100 per person. And I'm going to publish this on the web so you all know where the money's coming from. Because I, I can't run it with the money I've got, and there's no public financing yet. And actually just challenge whoever they're running against, and I would hope somebody would do that with Livem here in town. Um, just to say to take that on, we're not going to accept any other money out, outside of that, and maybe no PAC money, you know, and put some rules down, and let and then let's have public debates in a variety of places where people can know and see us, and go on shows like this, and and you know, public television, and and, and actually have a, a race and a debate. Now, maybe that's idealistic, but it'd be interesting to see if the public would respond to that on a local level. I think it might. I'm a little more optimistic yeah. than Mary Lynn about I, that. I, I would be very maybe. pessimistic because I would say that one of the uh, repercussions of people being only 6% uh, positive about their elected officials is they've turned off to them. They're irrelevant. They don't listen. <coughs> I don't think they, li they would listen to a politician coming out and saying, I'm going to limit my campaign funding and so on. <coughs> I think it's gotten so bad and it smells so bad that people are saying, I'm not even going to listen to you because I don't think you're telling me the truth. So I, I don't know that anybody could sincerely sell in this environment that they are in clean, really going to spend very little and be an ethical candidate. And maybe we're going to have to have a generation of citizen, citizen candidates then. Yeah. You, know, you know, the yeah. last, I was intrigued about a comment you made in the last segment we talked about where this next, this generation of legislators are almost, you know, homegrown politicians that I know that uh, Joe and Joe's no exception, Liveham and others I'm told went to candidate school and they were groomed to handle the media and groomed to handle those types of things. And maybe it's going to have to take just regular, you know, folks interested in public affairs again yeah. to, 
to say I'm not a professional politician, and perhaps it's going to have to be tied to term limits. I'm a little more skeptical of term limits than, than some folks, but maybe it is a promise that I'm going to do this for six years or, or eight years, and then I'm, I'm coming back and living here with you again. I don't know if that would generate some enthusiasm or not. And local levels, I don't think anybody yeah. cares about Congress. <laughs> well, you know, we really don't. I mean, but, first but, of all, the Congre congressional seats are <laughs> gerrymandered and that's not right. competitive anyway. Right. There, so, there are no, you know. there are no, uh, there's really no competitive congressional seats in Wisconsin. In 1998, yep. there were as many as four. Exactly. Now there's not. You, you could argue maybe the Fox Valley, where Mark Green's leaving, yeah. is somewhat competitive, mm -hmm. but every other one is utterly uncompetitive. And, and in the legislature too, there's only a handful of seats that are really truly competitive. Most have been gerrymandered, as you mentioned, and totally safe. I mean, the proof of that is that uh, Scott Jensen, who was criminally charged in 2002, has been reelected twice since he was criminally charged because the district he represents has been is so Republican. Gary George, for years, reelected, although people had a sense that he was, you know, less than above board, reelected overwhelmingly until finally he was taken out in the primary. But so that's the problem, is that you don't, you don't have competitive elections. People do become frustrated, and they do say thing, they do turn to think, solutions like term limits. That happened in many states about 10 years ago, uh, in 1994. Uh, but, the, but the alternative to term limits would be campaign finance reform. And, and the, the model, and there's one in place that we could emulate, is Minnesota. I mean, the difference between Minnesota is what, they have more Swedes, we have more Norwegians. But basically, we're pretty, the same, pretty much the same. I mean, there's not a lot of difference, you know. Well, they got I mean, Garrison Keillor. They've got Garrison uh, Keillor, you know. not we, enough Irish. Well, that's right. We have more Germans, and we drink more beer, but they probably drink more vodka. So, you know, but, but the but point is that it works there because they, in 1994, put into place in, in, in a system of reform where they had some public money and they had uh, uh, spending limits, and every legislative candidate, everyone, Republican or Democrat abides by spending limits in Minnesota, so they, they operate on an equal playing field. Everybody ha raises the same amount of money, spends the same amount of money. The lower house is turned over several times during that period because it's one on ideas. In the governor's races in Minnesota, the spending limit's $2 million. Wow. Jesse Ventura was elected, for better or for worse, in 1998, mm -hmm. but he was elected not because of money. He was elected because he did better in debates than Norm Coleman or Hubert Humphrey III. And people liked that. It was, it, was a, it was a battle of ideas in Minnesota. We don't have that here. In Wisconsin, it's whoever has the most money wins the race. And I think there is a chance that we could return and sort of in, 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 in emulate Minnesota. And at least if the Packers can't beat the Vikings, we could at least do as well as, as Minnesota does in our elections. We can, we can come back to that place, I'm convinced. Gee, there, or could could, could PAC uh, committees uh, take the place of the candidates spending money? I mean, you had, so the candidate says, I promise I'm going to, or we're not going to spend X amount of dollars, or this is the amount that I'm, mm -hmm. but then there's maybe 15, 20, 30 PAC committees that could go ahead and continue to spend and, uh, uh, on behalf of the candidate. Well, what you can do, and Senator Ellis, who we talked about, I mean, his plan, basically, and it's pretty radical, what he says is that, you have spending limits, but what you also do is you provide some public financing to candidates who are the targets of those outside groups. So let's say you're a Republican candidate, and the teachers union, WEAC, says we're going to spend a half a million dollars to defeat you. Well, under the Ellis plan, you would be eligible to receive public financing to match the money that WEAC spends. And what Ellis, who is a fiscal conservative, bets, and I think he's right, is that WEAC wouldn't spend the money. Why would they? It would be an inefficient use of their money if you're going to be matched with an equal amount to defend yourself. So WEAC then does not spend the money against you. Instead, what they do is they go on the ground and they spend money like they used to. I mean, I'm just old enough to remember when teachers would come to my door or business people from the Chamber of Commerce and said, we think you should vote for this person because we think they'd be good for business or for good for education. That's what they should be doing. They shouldn't be spending their money on attack ads on TV. So the, the beauty of the Ellis plan, in my view, is that it sort of encourages those outside groups to stay out and, and get involved in other ways. Right. And then it becomes a battle of ideas rather than money. And you know, I think if we did that, if we had something like that in place in Wisconsin, people would have much more confidence that their government wasn't being bought and paid for. We'd have more people that would run for office because they wouldn't feel like they have to take out a second mortgage on their soul in order to run for office. 
So I think for, there's a lot of positive benefits to having reform. And look, people's faith in government right now, it can't go any lower. <laughs> I'm an optimist. You have to be as a reformer. It can, it can only get better. Uh, my wife would suggest I'm in denial, but, I, but I'm actually an optimist that we can actually have a system in place that, that, that would be better for all of us. And we can reconnect, reconnect people to, to their government, which I think is desperately needed. And then you, then you have all the legal challenges, though. You just issued a, a press release on the uh, Supreme Court uh, 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 sending back the um, uh, Wisconsin Right to Life uh, uh, challenge to the McCain-Feingold Act. And uh, so it, it, does, does money equal free speech? Uh, the, 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 the courts have muddied the waters. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, and comprehensive campaign reform can be termed or can be framed as a, uh, as a uh, unconstitutional. 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 Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, denial of free speech, free access to being able to express your ideas and so forth. It's tough. Which well, you might imagine, um, you can write a campaign finance law, and we've done this with Senator Ellis, that, that would survive constitutional scrutiny. And you can do it in such a way. You can't force a candidate, for instance, to take public financing. You can't force them uh, to agree to spending limits, but you can provide incentives for them to do so. If it's voluntary, you're not compelling them to do it. So you can construct a system. And in the case of Wisconsin Right to Life, I mean, one of the great misnomers is that campaign finance reform somehow restricts free speech. It really doesn't. It really I mean, doesn't. Well, no. In fact, what it, money does not equal speech. <laughs> money equals more speech. And the more money you have, the more speech you have. But it's not, it's not, it doesn't, if you have reform, that doesn't mean you can't speak. Wisconsin Right to Life wanted to be able to run ads depicting Senator Feingold in the period right before the election. But they wanted to, and they can still do that. They can run ads. All groups do it. There's no problem with that. But they wanted to be able to use undisclosed, unregulated money, which is against the law in Wisconsin and against the law on the federal level. But they wanted to be able to use it. They claimed it was for lobbying. Well, in fact, it wasn't for lobbying purposes. They wanted to influence the outcome of the election. But they claim it's for lobbying. What's interesting is Wisconsin Right to Life didn't run those ads after the election. They didn't run those ads in the period before the election, six months before when the issue they were talking about was really most cogent, they did it, they wanted to do it in the period right before the election to influence the outcome. So you, there are way, you have to face these things head on and you have to take them. And obviously they have to survive constitutional scrutiny. The US Supreme Court upheld the McCain-Feingold bill in just two years ago. And I five think- Five-four. Five-four, well that's right. And <laughs> so. as you might imagine, one of the reasons why Right to Life would bring this challenge up is they're hoping there'll be a different outcome. Uh, ultimately with the different composition of the Supreme Court. Although I would be doubtful that would happen because I think the U.S. Supreme Court would be very hesitant to overturn a precedent that was set so recently on this issue. Jay, they have, so they have told us in their, uh, in their hearings. Jay, yeah. we've focused a, a great deal on the previous program and this one so far on Ellis's plan <coughs> and Wisconsin's plan. Uh, you're affiliated with the National Common Cause and we have Abramoff uh, scandal, it's probably, you know, in dollars and cents, a lot worse than the Wisconsin scene. What are you hearing from National Common Cause about prognosis for real reform, if any, and who's, who, are, who are the leaders on the federal level to, to bring this about? Well, the, uh, the names John McCain and Russ Feingold resonate with you. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's whenever most reform <clears throat> tends to be with the reform-oriented legislators, and they prove to be a pretty potent combination. but. The question on the federal level right now is more lobbying reform. It's mm -hmm. not so much campaign finance reform. And, you know, look, when I was an aide in Washington, uh, I got free trips all over the world. And I was definitely influenced. I still to this day have very favorable feelings about Taiwan. I got a free trip to go to Taiwan, and it certainly influenced how I feel about it. And there's been, that actually is, some of the free travel has been cut over the years. But what it's been replaced by at the federal level have, has been these, these, these smaller trips, but with more campaign contributions. And certainly Abramoff gave a lot of money only to Republican candidates, but he gave trips and, uh, to both sides. But there is a move underway at the federal level to make it so that it's next to impossible uh, to accept free things. Right now there's a $49 or $50 limit on lunches. I mean, I, I could get a pretty big lunch for 50 bucks in <laughs> Sheboygan or Madison, but, but, it, but, but, but the idea is that a lot of people would they would take, lobbyists would take congressmen out 
and they'd spend $49 many times so that they would never come up to that $50 limit. So there's reform, and basically, you know who's got the best model in the nation? Wisconsin. Our model, as you know, in the legislature is but the cup of coffee roll. If yeah. it's worth more than a cup of coffee, you can't take anything from a lobbyist. Mm -hmm. And they should do that at the federal level. There's absolutely no reason why staff people and, and congressmen you know, should be getting free gifts or free lunches uh, because, you know, let's be honest. I mean, it does have an influence on in how people behave. So there is legislation afoot, and because of the fallout from the Abramoff scandal and Tom DeLay, my guess is they'll get some, some lobby reform. Yeah, I, I, my sense is that, again, these are just p political tsunamis, really, in, yeah. in some respects. I mean, to have uh, delay taken down, yeah. to me, that was... Significant. Significant. There yeah. we go. It, it, it was something that I just simply would not believe could have ever happened. Right. And uh, Abramoff kind of seemed to creep up on everyone, but there's someone whose tentacles are absolutely everywhere. And, you know, so maybe there are some possibilities and I really like Ken's idea just a real what would it be like and we've talked about third-party politics and typically it would come out of a third party but what would it be like really to have an election that is fought on ideas and not in the media and not on pandering TV commercials that dumb down the American consciousness to its morning in America I mean See, I, I thought when the 94 election was a campaign of ideas with the, uh, with the Republicans, contract with America. I mean, that was brilliant. And I hate to stop the show, but, but we're, we're <laughs> out but of... That was ideas. We're but they've of, all, they've become... I know. They've compromised it, their ideas. They've comp I agree. And we're out of they, time, <laughs> and we have to finish with the contract on America, which breaks my heart, Tom. But in any event, Jay, it's been Thank wonderful. You. Thank Thanks you for traveling terrific. to Sheboygan. Love and it, love uh, it we'll be with you again. Thank you.